Okay, so we will start the, the second second session, what what I called the second session because the the repartition the division is also mine. Um, the second session that I call the middle prehumans and the earliest artifacts, and we are starting this uh, session well as I told you before, because unfortunately Bill Kimball couldn't come for health reason. Uh, what I call middle prehuman, well, as you can understand, it's a strange way to call them, but I call middle prehuman, it's, it's not human, of course, as they are prehuman, but it's after the f very first one that uh, we heard about this morning, and after the, the ones or which are contemporaneous or contemporaneous of uh, humans. So it's mainly Australopithecus and, and uh, Kenyanthropus. So the first, the first speaker would be Ron Clark, Professor Ron Clark. Um, is he there? Yeah, sorry. And uh, well, I must say that I'm very happy to have uh, invited him because as, as you know, uh, he's the one who recognized a uh, little foot, a uh, few bones from, from a foot in the, in the collection of the Waters the uh, University of Johannesburg. It's a beautiful story. And then he recognized uh, another bone which was uh, broken and then could go in, in Stairfontaine Cave uh, according to, to uh, what the, the paper of 1938 was uh, saying. And uh, in, in the bottom, level two of Stierfontaine, he could uh, find uh, the, the remain part of, of the broken bone. It's, it's fantastic, isn't it? And uh, after working in the cave, well, he disappeared. Uh, Ron disappeared for, for years. He was in the cave, he was in this cave. And he just uh, pre prepare uh, bone after bone, uh, almost complete uh, skeleton. So we were proud of Lucy in 1974, but uh, he found uh, about the same age, but much more complete uh, skeleton of, of Australopithecus. So um, uh, we were very happy to have him here. And personal, personal, uh, personal souvenir, we met in Kenya, Ron, you remember? We met, in, we met in Kenya in, in uh, well, just before independence, not our independence, but the independence of Kenya, uh, 1963, something, something like that, long time ago. So um, we, we met in East Africa before South Africa, and I was happy enough to, to have been with, with him in 2000, I think, in the bottom of uh, Stairfontaine II, uh, to, to see, well, just the beginning, just the beginning of the skull, actually. The skull was still in the in the breccia, and uh, it was well. It was al already difficult for me to not to go down. It was okay, but to to go up from the bottom of your cave. So very happy to see to see you, and very happy to have you here. So Ron, we are hearing from you. But I need. I need the uh, slide. He has it. He has it. Oh, he has it. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Can I begin? Yeah. Um, well, good morning. Uh, yes, that. Is real. That is the actual skeleton of Littlefoot that you see there. The world's first near complete Australopithecus skeleton uh, from the Sturkfontein Caves. Now, most of you know the Sturkfontein Caves, but for those who don't, the caves are situated in Dolomitic limestone uh, about half an hour's drive from Johannesburg, or 45 minutes from the uh, center of Johannesburg. Uh, so quite close um, and quite accessible, unlike, unlike Chad. <laughs> 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 the 
the, um, the very first adult Australopithecus was found at the Sturkfontein Caves in 1936 by Robert Broom there, uh, seen in his characteristic dress, waistcoat and, and high collar and tie. Um, it was this crushed cranium um, with actually a fairly complete dentition. And in 1938, at the age of 72, he said, I think it is very likely that within the next couple of years we shall find other specimens of Pleistocene apes, because in those days they called them apes, and perhaps much of his skeleton. If we could find a pelvis, a foot, and a hand of either of the Sturkfontein or Cromdry ape, the importance of the discovery would be greater than all the previous discoveries put together. Now, nine years later, he did indeed find a pelvis and a vertebral column, but unfortunately, no hand and no foot. That would be 60 years later. In other words, 1998. And the way that came about is rather interesting. In um, an underground part of the Sturkfontein cave system, beneath the um, site, the excavation site where Broom found the first adult Australopithecus, uh, there is this so-called Silberberg Grotto. And it was named uh, Silberberg Grotto by Philip Tobias after this gentleman, Dr. Helmut Silberberg, who was a Johannesburg art dealer, who in the 1940s, the early 1940s, was collecting fossils from there that had been blasted out by lime miners. And in 1945, the famous French prehistorian, the Abbe Henri Bruy, recognized this uh, specimen that you see on the top left um, as, a, a, as an interesting fossil, which he took to Dr. Robert Broom, who identified it as a Pliocene hyena. Uh, Broy, I should say, was visiting the art gallery of Silberberg, and he saw this fossil there. He took it to uh, Broom, who identified it as a Pliocene hyena that we now call Chasmoporthetes silberbergi. And for the first time, Broom realized that Sturkfontein was far older than he had previously thought. It was Pliocene and not Pleistocene. There you see uh, the Abbey Bruy uh, with Broom in 1950 looking at a Paranthropus cranium. In 1978, Philip Tobias on the left there, you, many of you know him, and Alan Hughes began removing lime miners' rubble from that Silberberg Grotto, hoping that they would find a hominid as old as Australopithecus afarensis, as old as Lucy. Here on the left, you see a generalized section of, this, of the Sturkfontein deposits uh, with members uh, four, five, and six near the top. Member four um, is the third one down, the, the large one uh, down from the top, uh, which yielded the majority of the Australopithecus fossils that we have to date from that site. Beneath it is the massive member three, which has not yet been excavated because it's only exposed in a vertical wall. And beneath that is the member two. And you see the green arrow there pointing to a red square in the next picture. That is a section through the Silberberg Grotto and the red square marks the position of the skeleton that I'm going to be talking about. Here we are down in the Silberberg Grotto and on the, on the um, lit up wall there in the center of the picture 
you, you can see some sort of uh, scalloping impressions. Those were left from the stalagmite. There was a huge stalagmite boss that was blasted away by lime miners probably in the 1920s. And that is member three, which as you can see is a vertical wall and uh, difficult to excavate. But one day in the future it should be possible. The rubble which uh, Hughes and Tobias removed from that cave unfortunately didn't yield a single hominid, but it yielded hundreds of fossils of carnivores and of monkeys and very few bovids. This was unusual because in member four, much higher up, we had a lot of Australopithecus fossils and also a lot of bovids. So I began to look through the boxes of bones that had been processed from that lower cave. And to my surprise, I found these four bones from a left ankle and foot, which I recognized as being those of an Australopithecus. And then uh, in 1997, I found more of the same, uh, same foot and uh, ankle, uh, sorry, heel, um, the heel bone, the um, calcaneus, and the lower tibia. There you see it on the uh, upper left of the picture. And on the upper right of the picture, you see it reconstructed in the center of the picture next to a human foot. And on the, um, on to, to the side of it, you see the lower right tibia and one right foot bone. So I said, well, if, if we have the lower legs and feet of one Australopithecus individual, the rest of the skeleton must be in the cave. I gave a cast of that lower right tibia to my two assistants, Stephen Motsumi and Nkwani Malefi, seen there in the uh, lower picture, and asked them to go into the cave with lamps and see if they could find anywhere it would fit on. Remarkably, after one and a half days of searching, they found the spot. And this is the position in the cave. It's in complete darkness. We, we have to uh, use handheld lamps to work there. And here is a picture taken much later after we'd started to expose the uh, lower tibiae. Um, and there you can see casts of the, of the tibiae fitted on to the rest of the shafts. Uh, after some excavation, we had uncovered the complete tibiae and parts of the fibulae and uh, the lower femora. But as we continued on and on and on, um, up the, up the slope, we found no more. And I thought, this is very odd. How can you have two lower legs and feet and not the rest of the skeleton? And I realized um, there on the uh, lower right, uh, I realized there was a cavity underneath and formed the conclusion that the only thing that could have happened is that the upper part of the skeleton had collapsed down millions of years ago into that cavity and then been sealed over by flowstone. And there on the left you see a, a diagram showing the flowstone going over the upper part of the skeleton but beneath the lower legs. So we excavated through that flowstone and found the skull. Um, there on the upper right, you see the beginning of the exposure of the skull. And, and from now on, we used only air scribes to uncover uh, the complete skeleton. And this is why the whole process has taken 20 years, because we used air scribes down in that cavern, uh, slowly uncovering every bone. Here is uh, a picture showing the skull in the center, the skull exposed with the humerus, the left humerus jammed behind the mandible. 
Um, up on the left, you can see the arrow pointing to the left forearm and the hand. So the, uh, it's clear from this that the humerus, which is next to the skull, had slipped down slope, and we later found it was still attached to the uh, scapula and the clavicle. Uh, this indicated that the body must have been mummified and that the upper arm had separated while it was in loose material, separated and slipped down slope. It then became uh, calcified in its current position. And then uh, much later that uh, flow stone, with, uh, the arrow to the uh, right is pointing to the remnant of the flow stone that we've removed. Um, that flow stone sealed in the whole skeleton apart from the lower legs, which, which you can just make out there to the left of the arrow on the right. So the legs are above the flow stone, the rest of the skeleton is beneath it. Here is the situation again. There is uh, Stephen Motsumi, one of the two who found the location and he is holding the casts onto the tibiae. And in front of him, among all those rocks, is the rest of the skeleton. Here is a section drawn by Laurent Bruxelles, who uh, I thought was going to be here today. Um, but Laurent Bruxelles has been doing excellent work on studying the stratigraphy, not only in the uh, lower Silverberg Grotto, but also in the rest of the cave and in other caves nearby. Um, and he has found that there was a gradual but simple long-term deposit uh, accretion there. There's no sign of any collapse of overlying deposits into the lower cave. And this is a primary association between the sediments of member two and the STW573 Littlefoot skeleton. I should uh, explain to you why it's called Littlefoot. When I found those first four foot bones, I showed them to Philip Tobias, and he said, oh, what a little foot, ha ha ha, that's a good name for it, isn't it? Let's call it Littlefoot. So when, when we found the rest of the skeleton, of course, that had to be known as Littlefoot. Uh, the dating, uh, dating um, was uh, conducted initially on the flow stones, but as I've shown, and I will show in, in subsequent slides here, those flow stones are intrusive, and they cannot be used for dating the skeleton. So more recently, um, Darrell Granger uh, and co. Um, investigated the breaches with cosmogenic isochron dating. Um, and they came up with an age of 3.67 million years for Littlefoot, based on the isochron dating. Uh, they took a, a series of nine samples, uh, 11 samples here, nine of them fall on this isochron, and uh, two of them uh, were rejected. Uh, those are the red ones to the top and to the bottom. But nine of them fit very comfortably on that isochron. And uh, he's very, very confident of this date of 3.67 million years. Uh, here's a rather beautiful view of the skull as it was exposed in the breccia with the uh, humerus jammed behind the mandible. Uh, this is how we exposed it. Um, this is a posed picture, of course. When we're actually working there, we wear masks and, uh, and um, protective eyewear. Um, but you wouldn't have recognized me if I had those on, so I took them off for the post picture. <laughs> uh, right. No, we often get asked to pose for pictures by various people, so, uh, but this is rather a good one to show the equipment we used this, this little air scribe uh, driven with a small compressor. Uh, each block of stone that was around the bones we had to expose carefully with that air scribe. Uh, we couldn't use hammers and chisels. Uh, 
uh, not only because of the danger of accidentally hitting any bone that was hidden there in the breccia, but also because the vibrations could have damaged the bones. So every stone we had to uh, locate, isolate with the air scribe, and then disintegrate it with the air scribe, or dig underneath it to remove each stone individually. So that's why it took so long. Further up slope, we found the arm and the hand, beautifully preserved, the radius and ulna there, still articulated with the wrist and the hand. Uh, here is the block after it was undercut and taken out, and you can see all those stones that are still in the block, and remember it was covered with stones as well. Even the hand had a huge stone sitting in the palm, and it was not a stone tool, it was a dolomite block. Um, it was, uh, all of those had to be removed very carefully. Beautifully preserved, um, the ra uh, proximal ends of the radius and ulna still in articulation. And here you can see to the right the breccia uh, with the, uh, at the bottom there in the center, the two femurs broken through in mid-shaft. And this is what happened. When there was an ancient collapse, it broke through the femurs, and then the cavity that was left was filled with that flowstone. So this is absolute proof that that flowstone came in after the collapse and after the bones had been calcified within the breccia. So there were several events. This is another reason why it was very important to take this slowly because we learnt a lot about the stratigraphic events and about taphonomic occurrences throughout the history of this skeleton's deposition. Here's another one, very nice, with the tibiae and the femora, and there you can see the flowstone uh, coating the breaks through the bones. The skull as well is interesting. Um, there on the, on the left, you see the skull, and at the back of the skull is breccia still adhering to it, and through the center of that breccia, you see a crack that is lined with calcium carbonate, and that extends right into the skull, into the brain case, and you can see it there in the scan on the right, in the CT scan, that crack extends through and is lined with calcium carbonate. Now this too is proof that the skull was calcified, the breccia within the brain case was calcified. It could only have been cracked in that manner and later filled with calcium carbonate again uh, if it had been solid breccia. If it had been loose material, you wouldn't get a crack like that running through the breccia and through the skull. This is how we worked. Um, there, there are two men, that's Stephen Motsumi and Arbo Molopoli, um, excavating the bones. There's a little compressor there uh, at the back, that red compressor. Um, and also, right at the back in the center of the picture, you can see a remnant of that calcium carbonate, the flowstone that was overlying the whole skeleton. This is how it looked after we'd exposed many of the bones in situ. And the whole operation was constantly being filmed and recorded um, on camera by Paul Myberg. Um, it was also recorded by scanning when it reached this stage uh, by Gerard Subsol and colleagues, and Jose Braga, who's sitting next to me here. Now, in the, it's, it's appropriate here to think of Michelangelo in this setting. And whilst I was exposing the skull, I did have uh, th thoughts about the way sculptors uh, remove uh, whatever it is they're trying to obtain from the block of marble. Now, in Michelangelo's case, he must have had some idea, or perhaps he didn't, um, of what was, what was going to emerge from this, um, from this block of marble. 
And you can see this in the Academia in Firenze. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful sculpture. There are several of them like this. And this one is called the Awakening Slave. So here on the right, you see the Awakening Little Foot uh, emerging from the breccia. Here again, the air scribe used to uh, remove the breccia. And there you see the awakening little foot peering out. Well, it's rather like a Rodin sculpture now. Uh, one of the problems we had, of course, was the bones being intertwined with each other, jammed against each other, and intertwined with rocks. And here you see the clavicle, uh, the right clavicle, jammed against the uh, ascending ramus of the mandible. And it was very, very difficult to separate because it, the, the clavicle is in poor condition, very powdery and flaky. It had to be consolidated. Um, and it was welded to the crushed inside of the mandible. Here is the, uh, the right scapula. Uh, humerus and the upper parts of the radius and ulna. Um, and on the left there, you can see ribs and vertebrae that are sitting on top of them. Each one of those had to be removed uh, to get to the situation on the right. There is the scapula in position on the left, in position in the cave, uh, compared to a modern human scapula and, and upper humerus. And you can see that the, uh, the fossil uh, scapula is still articulated with the upper part of the right humerus. This is how the body may have looked when it was lying on that rocky debris slope. Um, we know it was mummified because so many of these bones were in articulation and had moved position on the slope, but was still articulated. And that could only have happened if it was mummified. These are stages in, in uh, exposing the skeleton. Once the blocks were removed to the surface, uh, then each bone was uh, carefully cleaned out, again with air scribes. The um, history of the skeletons, as I mentioned, Broom and Robinson found a partial skeleton seen there on the left, uh, STS-14, found in 1947, but it consisted mainly of uh, pelvis and a vertebral column, a couple of ribs, and uh, a piece of uh, a badly uh, preserved upper femur. Um, and then during the excavations of Alan Hughes and, uh, and Philip Tobias, another partial skeleton was discovered, STW, STW431. And, and note here that 431 has a larger pelvis than that of STS14. And then, then you get uh, the famous Lucy, uh, much more of the skeleton preserved. And finally, we get to Littlefoot, um, which is very, very nearly complete. We're unfortunately missing a lot of the foot bones because they were blasted off by the lime miners and never recovered. And we're missing parts of the pelvis because they were uh, disintegrated and washed away by water that was flowing through the cave millions of years ago. Littlefoot was about 1.3 meters tall. Um, I think it was a female uh, because of uh, features of the pelvis and of the skull, suggest it was female. It had limb proportions similar, similar to those of modern humans and very different to those of apes. Here you see the, uh, the two legs side by side on the left compared to the arm the left arm, and it's very obvious that the legs are considerably longer than the arm. The hand, also beautifully preserved, is in a clenched fist. Um, so 
it, it, the fingers curled over the palm after death, and it was preserved like that with the thumb across the palm. Very similar to our hand with um, a, a long thumb and relatively short palm and fingers, but much more muscular than ours. The pelvis, as I said, is, was in a poor condition, uh, although we can obtain some information from it. Um, and there it is on the left, still in the breccia, with a modern pelvis underneath. And there on the right, you can see what it looks like after cleaning with part of the vertebral column, the lumbar vertebrae, still in articulation. The dentition is very nice, but because the jaws are clamped together, we can't see the surfaces of the teeth. These are CT scans that were done by Taya Yashashvili. Um, and they show that it had very extensive wear on the anterior dentition. And in side view, you can see that sloping wear on the premolars. Um, it has very large canines. And there's much less aware on the M2 and M3. This is similar to the situation you find in Australopithecus anamensis, and this has been published by uh, Carol Ward et al., um, who, who pointed out that it had this very differential wear between the anterior and the posterior dentition, and Littlefoot has similar kind of wear. This contrasts with Australopithecus africanus, which has a much more even wear. You see it there on the right. <clears throat> now, uh, one of our colleagues, a member of the Littlefoot team, Amelie Baudet, um, has done excellent work on studying CT scans of the brain or, or the, um, the interior of the brain case um, and, this, and also of the inner ear. And these are some of her conclusions. She found brain asymmetry, as in both humans and apes, a relatively small brain, this was surprising, uh, 408 cc's unreconstructed, so it's probably a little larger than that, at the lower end of the range for Australopithecus. The frontal lobe is similar to other Australopithecus and Paranthropus, but it has less associative cortex than in later Australopithecus, but um, increased visual cortex. The inner ear has ape-like semicircular canals. The cochlea is similar to younger Australopithecus and Paranthropus, but differs from early Homo. Okay, now this one, uh, please, can we, can we get this one on the move? <laughs> it's supposed to move. Somebody in the booth has to move it for us. No, no, that way. Yes. Yeah. I can't do it here. Yeah. 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 Will it move? No. Ah, there. Okay. Yes. These are these are Amelie's scans. <clears throat> And here we have the inner ear, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. Beautiful work she's done. <clears throat> okay. Now, um, the question is, what species does Littlefoot belong to? Uh, there are several options. Uh, it could belong to Australopithecus africanus. It could belong to the second species that I've been champion championing for many years now, Australopithecus prometheus, that occurs at Sturkfontein and Makapanskat. 
Uh, it could belong to something earlier like Australopithecus afarensis or anamensis, uh, or it could be a completely new species. Now, which of these uh, do I think it belongs to? Uh, this is Australopithecus africanus, of course. The, the tong skull is the type specimen for that species. And, and there on the right, you can see some examples from Sturkfontein of adults which match uh, the tong child in morphology, but are much larger. So that's Africanus. This is also Africanus. A lot of people don't want to agree with this. Uh, I've worked on both of these specimens. I reconstructed them both, so I know them fairly well. And I've been saying in publications for many years that STW53 is a male Australopithecus africanus, and OH24 from Olduvai Gorge is also an Australopithecus africanus. These are not Homo habilis. Um, I'm not the only one who said this. Uh, Richard Leakey and Alan Walker have also published their views that these are Australopithecus africanus. So I will be using STW53 as a good example of a male Australopithecus africanus. Uh, STW53 is virtually identical to TM1511, which there's Broom's reconstruction of TM1511 um, in the center of the picture at the top. And on the left of it, you see uh, STW53, and they're very similar. And then when you go to the picture on the right, on the white background, uh, the dentition uh, of STW53 is almost identical to that of TM1511, which was the first adult Australopithecus africanus ever known. And the, the uh, frontal bone shows that the brain was very small in STW53, uh, like that of um, TM1511. The frontal bone fits perfectly onto the frontal lobe of TM1511. Uh, OH24 from Olduvai Gorge, uh, similarly, there you see it, the, m the more complete um, of those crania, compared to the less complete STS17 from Sturkfontein and Australopithecus africanus, and uh, really there's nothing to choose between them. They're the same in dentition, they're the same in facial profile. OH24 is an Australopithecus africanus. The second species that I've talked about is Australopithecus prometheus, named by Raymond Dart in 1948 on that specimen on the left, which is MLD1, the back of a brain case. Um, it, uh, Dart noted that it has a larger brain than Australopithecus africanus, um, and, uh, and plesianthropus, which we now include in A. africanus. And uh, there you can see also another feature of Prometheus, the vertical sides to the brain case that go with the uh, large, larger brain. To the right, you see the second specimen from Makapan's hut that he put in Prometheus, that mandible with very large molars and low bulbous cusps. Here's another specimen from Sturkfontein of Prometheus. Here you see Prometheus uh, compared to Africanus. Prometheus has a much larger, longer, and flatter face. In profile on the top there, you see um, some mac the two sides of the mac. Oh, it's actually two views of the same side of the maxilla of um, a Prometheus. It has projecting incisors with a diastema. The specimen beneath it is an Africanus that does not have such projecting incisors and has no diastema. A. Africanus on the left, made up of two specimens, one from Sturkfontein, one from Muckelpan's hut, which fits on it very nicely. 
and on the right you see Prometheus made up of two Sturkfontein specimens, much larger face in Prometheus, larger canines, flatter face, flatter frontal. If you look at them in back view, uh, there you see the type specimen of Prometheus on the upper left compared to a specimen of Prometheus from Sturkfontein on the upper right. They both have these high vertical sides to the vault, sides to the brain case, contrasting with the more sloping sides to the brain case seen in the three specimens of Africanus below. Uh, sorry, two specimens of Africanus below and one specimen of Afarensis seen on the bottom left. Run a, a, bit, a bit faster. Huh? A bit faster, please. Okay. We're nearly done. Um, this is um, on the, on the le lower left, you see a little foot with the ver vertical sides to the vault. So little foot is closest in morphology to A. Prometheus, but earlier at Sturkfontein, which could explain its smaller brain. So finally, thanks to the Littlefoot team, some of whom, whom are seen here, thanks to Stephen and Aquani, whose diligence led to the discovery in the cave of this uh, specimen in the first place. Thanks also to Yves Coppens and to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences for this workshop. And thanks to the uh, many donors who have supported the work over the years. Thank you.